Good evening. It's great to see so many people here tonight. Uh, I'm Cynthia Johnston. I'm the chair of the Friends of Senate House Library, and the Friends have organized this evening's event. The Friends of Senate House Library work to increase awareness of the library's nationally important collections and to raise funds in support of the library's activities for researchers. I imagine that all of you have already been interrogated as to whether you are, as of yet, a member as a friend of the library, um, as you filed into the Chancellor's Hall tonight. But just in case you escaped our scrutiny, I'll tell you that it is free to become a friend, and by joining, you can give Senate House Library valuable support and help to develop its collections. The Friends run a program of talks, lectures, seminars, visits, and social events. As a friend, you'll receive a regular newsletter with news about upcoming events and exhibitions at Senate House Library, as well as invitations to exclusive events for friends such as tonight. So this evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Simon Callow, CPE, actor, musician, writer, and theatre director, best known for his roles in Four Weddings and a Funeral, Shakespeare in Love, and A Room with a View. He's the recipient of the Laurence Olivier Theatre Award for Best Director. Simon will soon be appearing in return at his much lauded production of Tickens' Christmas Carol at the Arts Theatre, which runs from 8th December until 12th January. A new film of Christmas Carol will be shown on 11th December only in 285 cinemas. Simon is the author of numerous books, including Oscar Wilde and His Circle, and his autobiography, My Life in Pieces, uh, both of which are available for purchase tonight, um, and Simon has kindly offered to sign copies as well. Professor Michael Slater, MBE, is Emeritus Professor of Victorian Literature at Birkbeck, University of London, and a Senior Research Fellow of the Institute of English Studies. He's former editor of the Dickensian and a past president both of the Dickens Fellowship and of the Dickens Society of America. He is also honorary academic advisor to the trustees of the Charles Dickens Museum. Tonight, Simon and Michael will discuss Oscar Wilde's picture of Dorian Gray. There will be an opportunity for questions from the audience at the close. Simon, I want to begin by um, quoting Wilde himself, talking about this book when he said it's uh, all conversation uh, and no action. My people just sit about in chairs and chatter, he said. Um, and yet uh, it has been dramatized, um, and uh, um, very successfully so, I think. Yes, I, I don't know in my consciousness whether it's ever been a very successful stage play. Um, I can't think of a run of the picture of Dorian Gray in the West End. Uh, it's been a, a movie a couple of times. It's been a ballet, catastrophic. <laughs> uh, Matthew Bourne did that, it's terrible. Uh, um, and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so I, I, I'm not, it, it's surprising. He, he's slightly um, undersells himself, doesn't he? I mean, there's actually quite a lot of highly melodramatic action in yes, the book. Yes. Um, it, it's a little bit more uh, active than he suggests. But um, it, I, I, it's just possible that the best version of all has never been seen in England, and that was written by Michael McClearmore, a famous Irish actor. Um, I hesitated over saying Irish because, in fact, although he was the most famous Irish actor of his time, he wasn't Irish at all. <laughs> he came from Wilston, actually. <laughs> um, but he's a, 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 I mean, I raise him because it, it sort of, he, he famously played uh, um, Lord Henry Wood. And uh, I've sort of mentioned him because he's also a very strong connection for me to Wilde. Well, because of your acting. Um, <clears throat> because of his, uh, the importance of being earnest. Uh, Oscar. Oscar. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, I think you, you say um, 
that he uh, has in that show, which you yourself then did, yes. um, a brilliant five-minute digest uh, of um, Dorian Gray. Yes, oh, it's I was, fantastic. I was wondering, you know, how you cut it down to five minutes. <laughs> it's brilliant. Uh, uh, that, that's probably why the picture of Dorian Gray is also rather brilliant. That I version. mean, he, he must age very fast. <laughs> he does. <laughs> it, it's sort of like, uh, yes, it, it's like a sort of um, terrible nightmare vision of Dorian Gray, what Michael does. But, but I should just, just explain a little bit uh, further back into that. Um, uh, it, it was an ex extraordinary event. My connection with Michael McClearmore is, uh, even to me now, somewhat surprising, which is that I was uh, quite briefly a student at Queen's University in Belfast. And uh, it was announced that Michael McClearmore, whom I, of course, knew of, because he was very famous uh, in his day, um, was going to do his show, The Importance of Being Oscar, in Belfast, and then come and adjudicate the other entries in the Student Drama Association competition, in which I was appearing. Um, and I, um, uh, 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 I was familiar with the gramophone records that he'd made of this show, which he created in 1960. So we're talking about 1968. It, it was relatively new, the show, and he'd done it all over the world with stupendous success. And it, he invented a new form of theater, uh, uh, one which I have subsequently stolen from him and used on many occasions, which is what I call living biography. That's to say, there were many one-man shows in the past in which someone would impersonate a character from history and say, I was born on the 23rd of November, 1872, my mother was a chambermaid, and um, that would present you with a monologue, basically. What Michael did was much more interesting. He was the narrator of the story, and he would impersonate Oscar Wilde a little bit here or there, not very much at all. Uh, and he'd take you rapidly and brilliantly through the life with extracts, moments of Wilde's conversation, and then digests of certain pieces. And one of them is the, the importance of um, uh, being earnest, in which he does the handbag scene, basically. Um, beautifully shaped, wonderfully done. But what made it even more remarkable, this show, was not only was he an extraordinary raconteur, he used to call himself a shanachi, the, the, the Gaelic word for storyteller, you know, the tribal storyteller. He told us wonderful, told the stories uh, uh, absolutely brilliantly. But what I uh, uh, had discovered, not everybody knew, was that he'd been a child actor in the London theatre before the First World War. And he played Oliver Twist to Beerbone Trees Fagin <laughs> at uh, His Majesty's Theatre. And um, he'd seen the first night of the Rite of Spring in London, the very first time it was ever performed in London in 1913. Uh, and uh, he'd met Sarah Bernhard. So, Michael, to a degree unusual, even in an actor of his age, at the, the time that he came to Belfast, he was my age now, 69, and uh, he, um, but he brought with him on the stage a memory, a direct memory, of the Edwardian Theatre, the immediately post-Edwardian Theatre, and um, somehow he brought, he summoned up on stage the whole world of pre-war theatre and, and, and art and letters and all of this. So, of course, Michael had the occasion to meet many of the actors who played the leading parts in, in the first productions of Wilde's plays. So it was a tremendously direct, you really did feel one of those six degrees of separation moments. I mean, uh, Wilde had died, died uh, it was in 1900, um, when Michael was a, a year old, but uh, very young, of course, he was only uh, before 46 when he died. Uh, uh, but, but, but Michael explained to me how the whole wild affair, the whole uh, trial of the imprisonment, had cast a terrible shadow over the whole of the London theatre, over the whole of uh, London society. Um, people were terrified of repeating his fate and all the rest of it. And uh, um, uh, 
maybe people had left the country and all that kind of thing. But for, for Michael, that was, when he told me about all of that, it was fresh news. It, was, it, it wasn't at all um, history. It was his experience. Sinister, that. <laughs> me, am I doing something? Is it? <laughs> the ghost in the machine. Yes. <laughs> Michael McLeod, probably. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, um, so uh, so I, I I got from that from my encounter with Guillermo an extremely vivid sense of, of Wilde as a as a living creature, not not a, something from the pages of history at all. And, and the, the Dorian Gray thing was particularly wonderful because what he did was to present it in its little five or six minutes as. Um, a, a, a genuine Victorian melodrama, which is, of course, really what it is. Uh, very stagey, it's a very stagey thing, but it was marvelously put together. It, it's sort of a scream of consciousness of what happens to Dorian. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and I, anyway, I was utterly besotted with Oscar Wilde as a, as a, as a, as a uh, some of my first reading as, a, as a, an adolescent was, was Wilde. I was uh, uh, enchanted by his, uh, everything about him. And of course, the letters had just been published in that famous edition of Rupert Park Davis in, I think, 65, when I was 16. And that's the first book that I ever bought. Uh, and it was very expensive because it was a big book. First book that I ever bought. And so that really took you straight into Oscar Wilde's mind and probably gives you the best impression of what he might have been like uh, as a conversationalist, uh, because the letters are little sparkling, brilliant, witty and profound and generous, and and, yeah. and uh, altogether, I think, among the best letters in the language, really. They're especially generous, I think, to the uh, reviewers who attack Dorian Gray. Uh, 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 um, he's, he's very funny about them. Um, he was funny, but, but he was also a bit nervous, because the first... I think he was really worried about the review. Oh. He, he, he was taken aback by them, yeah, really. Um, by the virulence of them. Yes, and, and also by the fact that they they really, um, you know, Dorian Gray popped out of nowhere as far as Wilde was concerned. He, he'd written uh, essays and he'd written poems, which were not very highly regarded, and he'd written, uh, I think, a couple of the, the, the fables, the, the um, fairy stories. Yeah. The Happy Prince. Uh, he, the Happy Prince. Yes, exactly. He was the editor of, um, had been until very recently, the editor of the Woman's World, <laughs> um, which he turned into a sort of vehicle, a rather um, you know, proselytizing vehicle for the, for the um, uh, aesthetic movement, uh, as well as, interestingly, it was called the Woman's World, after all, giving space to suffragettes and, and to his own wife, uh, Constance, who was a perfectly good writer in her own uh, right, and, uh, uh, whose particular passion was, um, what, uh, if I can remember the exact correct phrase, it's uh, um, scientific clothes for women. <laughs> she was trying to get away from bustles and uh, all of the huge she, she, she wasn't a bloomer, was she? she <laughs> bloomer. I, know, I don't think she did. That was a bit earlier, I think. It was, it was sort of sensible clothes for women, was, was her big. Uh, Jack and he was he was very supportive of all that, but so so when the Dorian Gray came out, which was as we know, was, um, pro prompted by a, a, one of those remarkable moments in history, where um, the American publisher was it Scribner, uh, whoever it was who published it, um, he published a magazine because it was published in magazine form originally. Wasn't it Lippincott, it? it was called Lippincott. That's right, yeah. Lippincott, and Lippincott. Um, uh, invited two very promising young writers to come and have supper with him at the Langham Hotel. And those writers were Oscar Wilde and Conan Doyle. <laughs> and uh, I think Conan Doyle wrote his second home story for Lippincott, and Wilde offered Lippincott The Fisherman and His Soul, one of the uh, so-called fairy stories, and uh, Lippincott didn't think that was right for his readership, and so he gave him the picture of Dorian Gray. 
but much less was he good then in different books. I mean, it was quite short. It was shorter. Shorter. But I think it was in uh, was it not in installments? I don't or was it complete? I, I can't remember that either. But whatever it was, it caused an absolute sensation. It was denounced universally. Uh, um, uh, and, and but don't, don't you think that had a lot to do with the Cleveland Street scandal? Yes, I'm sure. Place in the same year. Yes, I'm sure. So that when the Scots Observer says the only people who will be interested or, or enjoy this are outlawed noblemen, um, and what was it? Um, was the phrase about uh, te oh. telegraph boys? I should oh think yes, and perverted telegraph boys. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Um, yes. Well, because of the Cleveland Street scandal, which was the same year that. Um, yes, down. which which uh, perhaps we should explain was a uh, 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 more or less a, 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 a brothel, a male brothel, uh, and frequented by the aristocracy and possibly by royalty. The thought was that Prince Eddie. The, uh, the, the Queen Victoria's, uh, not eldest, but uh, seventh or something, and so on, <laughs> was, was, uh, was, was generally thought to be gay, or assumed, assumed to be gay. And uh, so they were, there, was, there was shock horror all over London. And into that, well, Wilde plunged with his pretty openly gay story. In that version, it, when it was published in uh, uh, Hardback, he uh, uh, changed a lot. Of Is that when he brought in all the stuff about Sybil and so on? Yeah. He was published in Hardback. That yeah. wasn't in the Living Cops. I think Sybil's in it originally, isn't she? Uh, but but uh, the part very much. Yes, 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 yeah. Yes, he changed the, the balance, you know. Uh, and, and he was, he, as often with Wilde, he, he existed to provoke. <laughs> and he often provoked more than he really expected and wasn't always very good at handling it. And he then entered into one of those correspondences, which sort of um, is a pre premonition of his stance in the trial, uh, uh, the libel trial of 1995, uh, where he uh, purported <coughs> complete innocence to say, well, it's only dirty-minded people who will see <laughs> filth in this. I mean, gosh, I'm shocked at how uh, uh, prurient all these critics are, but it's absolutely, absolutely clear that uh, Lord Henry Wooden has a strong crush on Dorian Gray, and Basil Hallward, the painter, has an even more intense one, which is life-threatening in, in his case. Um, and, and the language in which uh, uh, Hallward, both Hallward and Wooden express their appreciation of Dorian's beauty is unmistakable. I mean, everybody knew that. There was no question about it at all. Uh, and he turned down a lot of that as so well. Is that why when it was um, uh, published as a book um, and considerably expanded, uh, did he bring in Sybil at that point? Yes. And and I, I, think, emphasize much more I think she's that? there already, but, but sort of as a bit part player. And then she, well, maybe not, I can't remember. But, um, I think she is mentioned. She's yes. there, but, but she becomes the sort of tragic yeah, heroine, yes. doesn't she? Exactly. But and you, you think he expanded all that to counteract totally. the gay act? No question about it. No question about it. Mm -hmm. um, Interestingly, uh, uh, he, he, he kept saying it's a, it's a morality. It's a morality story. Could Dorian get his come up? You know? um, well, he said all sorts of things about it, didn't he? That, yeah. uh, he said, my, my story is an essay on decorative art. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which it also is, it has to be said, uh, but that's the least convincing aspect of it. Uh, um, he, he, a, the, he has a, had a tendency then, and he, he, he always had a slight tendency to reproduce lists. Uh, uh, he actually transcribed the British Museum catalogue <laughs> at one point. It's just one of those, a whole page of, of uh, exotic uh, elements. Oh. It's just straight, straight out of the catalogue. Yeah. He wrote it very quickly. It's not, in some ways, a, a very well-written book. It's quite clumsy, I think, in some ways. But of course, when it absolutely sparks into phenomenal life is in Lord Henry Wooden's uh, um, uh, sort of virtuoso set pieces, yeah. which are a premonition of the plays. He had, he'd written plays before, but very unsuccessfully. Doesn't he say that Lord Henry is what he would like to be? Um, he would like to be. Uh, 
Yes, uh, hold on. He said, it, it, rather interestingly, he said of the characters then, he said, um, Basil Hallward is who he really is. The painter. The painter. But Lord Henry is who he would like to be. And, hold on, uh, no, um, no, it is Lord Henry is who the world thinks he is. And yes. Dorian is who he would like to yes, be. Yes. Understandable, that. Yes. <laughs> so, no, no, there's an interesting thing. Like, you see, what's completely fascinating to me is, just as in the trial, you think to yourself, now what was he really up to? What was he really thinking? Did he really think he'd get away with it? And the people would just not notice, or they'd think it was an exercise in style, a sort of Flaubertian stroke Balzacian exercise in style, or did he want to provoke him? Um, as in the trial, you know, he absolutely knew that what the Marquis of Queensbury accused him of was true. He knew that. He lied to his own solicitor about it, but he knew it, of course he knew it. Did he really, really think that he'd be able to get away with it? It's, it's a mysterious thing, it's a, it, and it occurs not infrequently in his life, as if he was pushing against, uh, either it was extreme he was also <coughs> pushed by Lord Alfred, wasn't he? Had this oh, in the trial, absolutely. Yes, yes. But, but, but he still needn't have, <clears throat> well, first of all, he shouldn't have the intelligence to say, but we'll lose if I go to court. But he, he, the, I think the thing that tipped Wilde into going to court, and I find this just absolutely fascinating, because as everybody knows, after the collapse of his libel suit against Queensbury, uh, a, a warrant was issued for his arrest. There was a window of opportunity mm -hmm. during which he was given every chance to leave the country. The, the government didn't want, actually, to send him to prison. They didn't want to make it a close survival. They didn't want to take on this whole thing because they weren't sure how widespread homosexuality was in the government. The Lord Rosebery, the Prime Minister, was thought to, I think it was the Foreign Secretary, no, was thought to be gay. And the, um, of course, Lord Alfred Douglas' elder brother was his secretary and killed himself. And the assumption that it was because his relationship with Rosemary was going to be exposed. So it was a really a tense and alarming situation. And uh, so they wanted him, they, they, it was made very clear to him that he could go. And Bernard Shaw and Frank Harris, the editor of the Evening Standard, told him that Frank Harris arranged a yacht to be standing by in the tent for him to escape. At that point, Wilde went to see. Bosey was dead against that. Bosey wanted the fight. He wanted Oscar to take on his father and humiliate him and all that. But Wilde went to his mother and said, Look, uh, I, there's a yacht I can go. She said, If you go now, never consider yourself my son any longer. You will stand and fight it out and fight for the truth. <laughs> <laughs> he, what, did she know then? The truth? No, I don't think she did. Or else she was wonderfully blind to, she, was, she, she had a you know, track record of ignoring uncomfortable truths because her own husband, of course, was uh, on trial for rape in Dublin <laughs> um, you know, 20 years before. His own, her own husband had illegitimate children, left, right and centre. But she always maintained that he was an entirely honourable man and anyway was a genius. William Wilde, her, her husband, and Oscar was a genius. And geniuses are allowed to do anything as long as they stand up for the truth. That was her theory. Is, is it known whether Constance wanted him to go? His wife? Oh, yes, she did. She wanted him to oh, go? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, 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 the last thing anybody wanted in his circle was for Oscar to go to prison. Uh, um, and Bosley refused to even countenance the idea that he would go to prison. But, uh, um, uh, 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 but Lady Wilde was perfectly happy for him to go to prison if he seemed to be a great Irish martyr. Mm. That's what she was keen on reading. Mm. And uh, her eldest son, William, was wasn't going to be that drunken journalist. But Oscar might have been. She wanted that very much. But uh, to, to continue this theme of the provocation, rather as I think it's been slightly discredited, the idea that earnest meant was was slang for gay. 
uh, that, that for a long while we thought that, but I don't think there's any real evidence for that. However, you mean before the play was written? Before the play was written, yes. So, so, so people didn't think, oh, the importance of being known it's a gay play. They didn't, I mean, even the Cognoscenti didn't think that. But in the case of Dorian Ray, uh, there was a, 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 a movement in, in, the, in the late 80s and 90s, uh, mostly uh, uh, the work of John Addington Simons, Simmons, I think it's pronounced, John Addington Simmons, which was the beginnings of gay liberation, basically. And Simmons was busy saying, look, homosexuality is a fact throughout history. We need to acknowledge that. In ancient Greece, Sparta, in many cultures, it exists. We have to, he was very, rather bravely, he was married as it happened, Simmons, but he was much more gay than he uh, was uh, not gay. And um, he uh, identified, rightly or wrongly, a tribe called the Dorians as a Greek, uh, as a Greek tribe mm. which had made pederasty the absolute center of their culture. And everybody who was interested in these things at all, which of course included Oscar and included every other homosexual that uh, was around, uh, knew that. So in his calling it picture drawing great. However, the really fascinating thing is that as far as we know, almost certainly, Oscar Wilde had not had sex with a man at that point. Really? I thought yeah, no, Robbie came after. His, 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 his sexual encounter with Robbie Ross came after that. Okay. And Robbie Ross always claimed that he was the person who had initiated one into uh, 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 homosexuality. Um, so what's this married man with two children, a relatively respectable figure by now as an editor of a paper, what's he doing putting all these coded references into uh, his novel, uh, um, when he's not actually done anything about being gay. And my feeling there is that he knew that he couldn't conceal it any longer. Or, or, or he didn't want to conceal it. Because from now on, his behavior was as extravagant and as camp as he could possibly manage. He'd been quite formal and respectable as the editor of the uh, woman's world. And he now, I think, was push to, 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 to acknowledge it. The other thing that's so uncanny about it is that um, uh, it, it, in, um, uh, what is it, on page two of the book, he, uh, he more or less uh, describes Alfred Douglas, although he'd never yet met him. Um, where are we? Uh, uh, Yes, yes I, I think people imagine that uh, Alfred Douglas is the original uh, yes. historian. No, no, no. You, you find that stated quite often. Yes, but absolutely. He hadn't even met him. Not met him at all. And, and in fact, uh, Wilde did by then, uh, but well, things started to move very quickly for a while after um, Robbie had relieved him of his virginity, so to speak. Um, he. Uh, <laughs> pathetic, I will find it in a second. Um, but. Uh, 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 um, he had a boyfriend called John Gray. John Gray, who later became a priest. He was a poet, wasn't he? He's a poet, mm -hmm. and became a priest, uh, 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 had a boyfriend then called Andrei Rafalovich. Um, uh, 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 it, it, one was now suddenly moving in, in rather openly gay circles. Uh, and, uh, but the, 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 the reference to Lord Alfred Douglas is, uh, I'm sorry, I'd really better find it because it's, uh, it's so um, surprising, and so it, it seems prescient, really. Um, uh, it's, no, I can't find it. it's just extremely silly of me. Um, uh, Maybe I could sing one of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, I think you would. And you know, um, <laughs> um, yeah, here we are. It's what Basil, Basil Walton says. He says, I found myself face to face, says Basil, uh, of meeting Gloria and Gray, with someone whose mere personality was so fascinating that if I allowed it to do so, it would absorb my whole nature, my whole soul, 
my very art itself, which is absolutely precisely what uh, what uh, Bosley did uh, for a while. Um, it's interesting. John Anderson Simmons said um, that when Dorian Gray came up in the magazine form, he said, "If the British public put up with this, they'll put up with anything." It rather delighted he thought this is yes. <laughs> Um, he was living abroad, wasn't he? Simmons, Simmons yes, yeah. mostly in Italy and in uh, Greece and uh, Venice. And so that. he was living freer than. Yes, he was. exactly. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's, a, it's an amazing brew. I mean, the, the, the origins of the, of the story, which I think, well, essentially invented the story, it has something in common with Balzac's uh, Peau de Chagrin, where. Um, it, 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 it's that sort of um, slightly supernatural thing, the idea of the picture. Because with the Polish Chagrin, he has a, um, is given an ass's skin. The young man who's a gambler and is absolutely at the end of his teller, wanders into an antique shop and is sold this ass's skin. And he's told that this will be, uh, uh, will give him everything he wants in the world. If, if, if anything that he wants, if he holds the ass's skin, will be his. But every time he makes a wish, it will shrink a little bit more. And then finally, when it's gone, he's dead. So it's in that vein, the idea, isn't it? But did you think it's uh, um, also looking back to his, what was it, his great uncle, uh, the Gothic novelist. That's right. Yeah, yes. yeah. Because in his, uh, is it called Melmoth the Wanderer? Yes, exactly. And there, the, the portrait gets older. Yes. Is that? No, no, the other way around. Uh, he, he gets older, but the portrait remains. It's the opposite. Oh, of yes, what I see what you mean. In, yes, uh, yes. In, in um, Dorian Gray. And that's quite the resonant because. And he was very proud of his ancestors. Very proud of him. And when he, when he needed a pseudonym, uh, uh, when he uh, had come out of prison, he called himself Sebastian Melmoth. That's right, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, what's therefore completely fascinating about it, so, someone, an American scholar, wrote that in Dorian Gray, he wrote the script of his life. Um, uh, and and it, 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 it is, it's a strangely, but there's an atmosphere about it which is quite remarkable. I, I, I think I, I, I sort of stand by what I said about the writing being not um, sometimes being quite uh, mechanical and routine, but there's something in it. It's a, it seems to be the book that Wilde needed to write at that point. Somehow, I think he felt that dishonesty, a falseness about his own um, uh, public persona, uh, his, the way he was in society. But then, he, so, he's sort of actually tapping into the Faust legend. Yes, 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 well, yes, exactly. Um, which is one of the problems that the, he didn't really know what to do with the middle of the book, as it were. Yes. You see the beginning and the end, um, as in, you know, Marlis Faust, or uh, it's it's very difficult to find something to fill the middle. Yes, it's and true. So he well, finds it's Sizzle. Um, yes. No, yes. isn't exactly Gretchen, is she? I no, mean, no. Uh, um, uh, do, you, do you find Sybil convincing? Uh, not at all, but but not for a second. But but mm -hmm. she is interesting in that it's just a very typically Wildian notion that when she falls in love with Dorian, she can't act anymore. Yes, I was wondering what you thought yeah. of that. She loses her talent. Well, it's certainly true that if, if, if as an actor, you become too personally involved, you do cease to be able to tell the story of your character. I remember, for example, uh, I was thinking of this the other day, uh, Nigel Hawthorne might have you quite well had always wanted all his life to play Uncle Vanya because he felt that he was Uncle Vanya. That, that, because uh, Nigel became famous for quite late in life, as everybody knows. And he felt that his life was a failure, he was an absolute waste, and rather comically inadequate in so many ways. And so finally, when he could 
ask anybody to do anything he wanted. He said, I want to do all the money. And it was no good at all. <laughs> it was too, it was like, he felt too moved by playing Uncle Vanya. So no longer could we see the character. We just saw Nigel's emotion about playing Uncle Vanya, which is a very different thing. It's not quite the same thing as what happens to Sybil, but it's true that you, you well, the other thing about uh, the Sybil is that she can act Juliet wonderfully when yes. she's not in love, but yes. when she falls in love, she yes. can't, yes. Uh, or she, she acts it wrongly somehow, yes. but histrionically as it were. It's a very wild an idea that the, the imagination is true, the reality is false. <laughs> so she, having now got the experience of being in love, she, 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 she can't actually convey it. What surprised me when I, I reread the book, what I'd forgotten, was that Dorian actually repents doesn't he? He does this brutal thing of rejecting her. Yes. Because he thinks, you know, she's now no longer interesting. Yeah. Um, because she can't act anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, No, no, she is acting, that's the trouble, isn't it? Well, she, uh, yes, it looks like acting. It looks like acting, yes. Um, but then he, um, I'd forgotten <coughs> until I looked at the book again, um, that he, he's very brutal to her and casts her off and so forth. And then he goes home and he repents, and he's going to marry her. Yes. Do you remember? That's um, right. Yeah. And Lord Henry comes in, um, and he says, you know, I'm going to marry this, this wonderful girl. Yes, yes. And then Lord Henry shows him the newspaper, or, you know, yes, yes. about her death. And he goes back to his old ways, so to speak. But that's, exactly. Do you find that a bit strange? I mean, that, that Dorian has this fit of goodness in the middle. Yeah. I do. <laughs> I find it unconvincing and yeah. contrived and all the rest of it. As you say, he's filling in the, 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 the gaps. But the yeah. interesting thing is that well, Henry Wooten is consistently the Mephistopheles figure in it. And that he's the one that Wilde said he would like to be, isn't he? Uh, no, Dorian's who he wants to be. Oh, of course. The world thinks he's Lord Henry Wooten. And, right. and then I, and just one other thing I would like to read. If, of course, yeah. which is um, about uh, why it had a, you know, generally, one of the things I, as an adolescent, loved about Wilde was how generous and how benevolent he was, how, how thoughtful, how considerate, even as a conversationist, and he was without peer. Everybody said that, Yeats, Shaw, people who had every reason to be jealous of him for his conversational powers, said he was just, it was a magical, magical experience. But he wasn't one of those um, soloists. He listened to other people, he picked up on what other people said, he heard what they said, it was wonderful and delightful. And there are other wonderful stories that I've always cherished about him, um, going to visit a friend with toothache and the buckle saying, I'm sorry, um, uh, his lordship is, is such pain he can't see you. And Wilde said, no, 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 let me see him. And going up and talking to the man and diverting him until within five minutes the toothache had gone, you know. I mean, that, that sort of reasonably well attested that sort of stuff. So essentially, I've always had this idea of him as being an innocent, of being uh, corrupted by Bosey and so on. But well, didn't they, in fact, actually applaud him in court? when he made that great yes. speech about homosexual love. The great and completely disingenuous speech about homosexual love. That speech, the point of the speech was to say, how disgusting you all think that men who love each other copulate, how shocking you all are. This is just a divine uh, a blessing, this uh, love between two men. I and mean, they applauded. They applauded, of course, he was a fine, a fine, fine speaker. But there was another side to him, and I, I was reading a a biography of Andre Gide some while ago. And Gide actually wrote a book about Wilde. Um, uh, 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 really quite an interesting one. And Have they met? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. No, they, they met in uh, Algeria. No. When Bosey and, uh, and uh, uh, Wilde, actually, the, the last time they met was when Bosey and Wilde were sort of on holiday waiting for the second trial to start. Uh, um, spending vast amounts of money and smoking a lot of hashish, uh, which Wilde adored. Bosley loved even more. Um, but this is um, uh, 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 this is uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, something uh, 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 that happened in 
1891, when Dorian Gray appeared. While he was in Paris, where he met the young and very conventional André Gide, he set about liberating him. Oscar sidled up to Gide conspiratorially and whispered to him, shall I tell you a secret? But promise me not to pass it on to anyone else. Do you know why Christ did not love his mother? Because she was a virgin. <laughs> there are two worlds, he told Gide. One of them is without people speaking about it. We call that the real world, because there's no need to speak about it in order to see it. And the other is the world of art. That's the one you have to speak about, because otherwise it wouldn't exist. And then he said, I don't like your lips, he said to Gide. They're straight, like those of someone who has never lied. I want to teach you how to lie, so your lips become beautiful and twisted like those of an antique mask. Gide then wrote in his diary, Wilde is piously setting about killing what remained of my soul, because he says that in order to understand the essence of something, one must suppress it. In January 1892, he wrote, Wilde did me nothing but harm. In January 1895, meeting him again in Morocco, he wrote of him, this terrible man, this most dangerous product of modern civilization. Uh, that's very fascinating to me. Why was he so frightened of him? Gide. Yeah. Well, because, because I think exactly what he surmises is true, that he was very uptight, as we know. He was, he was very Calvinist and very proper and uh, uh, um, uh, tried fighting against, of course, his own uh, desires. And uh, um, he, he was, he knew that while smelt him out, and he was going to strip all that away and insist that he be true to himself. But, but that's very dishonest of Wilde, because Wilde wasn't true to himself, publicly, no. In the book, and in other books, he was uh, implied uh, in the portrait of uh, W.H. Of course, he goes as far as you could humanly go to celebrate yes. the, the love of a, of a boy for a man. And that had come out just before Dorian Gray. Yeah. Hadn't it? The portrait it was, of the it was all pointing in one direction. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just wondered about um, Sybil. I mean, she's not yeah, attractive at the moment. Yeah. But uh, what, how do you, as, a, as an actor, respond to the way one deals with that? That when she's when she starts acting, she's no good. Well, it, uh, it, it's it's true enough. Uh, I mean, it's acting a, is is a very curious art in the sense that. You learn lines, but in order to play them well, you have to forget that you know them. So it just comes to you. Unbidden. If you're standing there thinking of the lines, oh, what comes next, and this is, it, it, you, you're, you're, it will not have any feeling of spontaneity or truth about it. You have to, you have to, it has to come to you almost by surprise. He seems to be making you slightly different. No, no, I mean, I'm saying that the same thing could be true about emotion. Right. If you, you have to, in order to act, you, 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 you've got to give in to the character. You can't give in to yourself. It's a very conventional idea about acting. The Talma, the great French actor, there's a famous moment where he suddenly over tint from playing the part into some private emotion and his um, Rejane, who's acting with him, say, <laughs> this is a translation, but obviously saying in French, have a care, Talma, you are moved. <laughs> yeah. well, that's fascinating. And Diderot's, uh, the paradox of the comedian, is all about that, of the distance of the actor from emotion. Garrick was the supreme actor of his time because he could summon up any emotion like that just by thinking about it. <coughs> and so when she actually falls in love, she can't act Juliet anymore. Yes, it destroys her completely. That's, that's reasonable, that's true. I don't find that uh, 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 far-fetched in any way. So would you uh, please join me now in thanking our absolutely 
splendid and smart main speakers. Thank you for letting us. Thank you.